readers there. Oh, I'm going to go get myself some water. Okay, great job. Great job, Tracy. Feel good about it, Kayla?
Good morning, friends. Welcome. We're glad that you've joined us uh, this morning, this Sunday morning, as we praise the living God. Uh, it's been a long journey together in this uh, virtual world of worship, and we're glad that you have continued to remain steadfast, to trust uh, in the Lord, and for good reason, great is his faithfulness towards us. So we're glad that you're here this morning. Today, uh, I'm, I'll be talking to you about uh, turning points. Uh, everybody at some point needs a turning point. And the greatest place to find the turning point is at the cross of Jesus Christ. That is the place to find it. Uh, God bless you today in your worship. We hope and pray that the word of God would have true course that would ring in your ears um, in your in your mind and in your heart today. So God bless you as you worship with us this morning, wherever you are. Uh, let's open in prayer, then we'll begin our liturgy together, shall we? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your mercies are new every morning. Uh, we have uh, are missing the chance to gather and worship together as God's uh, church, to be in fellowship, to be present with one another. And yet, in your word, you promise that we're just two or three gather, there you are in our midst. We trust that you are here, that you are offering uh, true turning points for us, that the place for us to be is with you, following you, bearing our cross, being uh, where you are. So Lord, uh, we give ourselves to you, we deny ourselves, we follow you, Lord, where you lead us. Be with us as we worship. Uh, Lord, uh, may the words ring true in ears and hearts and minds. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, church, let's begin our worship, remembering our baptism. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Our opening sentences from Psalm 26 and Jeremiah 15. O Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. My foot stands on level ground, and the great assembly I will bless the Lord. Your words were found, and I ate them, and your words become to me a joy and the delight of my heart, for I am called by your name, O Lord, God of hosts. Father of mercy and grace, even though I deserve nothing but death because of my sins, I ask you not to sweep my soul away with sinners, nor my life with bloodthirsty men, in whose hands are evil devices, and whose right hands are full of bribes. Your steadfast love in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus is displayed before my eyes. Lord, I believe, and I ask that you would forgive me for Christ's sake, granting me the help of your spirit, for I desire to walk in your faithfulness. My dear friends, listen to the word of God. Thus says the Lord, if you return, I will restore you, and you shall stand before me. And so therefore, in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, do I announce to you once again the grace of God and the forgiveness of all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, whom to know is everlasting life, grant us to know your Son, Jesus, to be the way, the truth, and the life, that we might boldly confess him to be the Christ, and steadfastly walk in the way that leads to eternal life. For Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
Oh, Lord, you know, remember me and visit me and take vengeance for me on my persecutors. In your forbearance, take me not away. Know that for your sake, I bear reproach. Your words were found and I ate them and your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart. For I am called by your name. Oh, Lord, God of hosts. I did not sit in the company of revelers, nor did I rejoice. I sat alone because your hand was upon me for you had filled me with indignation. Why is my pain unceasing, my wound incurable, refusing to be healed? Will you be to me like a deceitful brook, like waters that fail? Therefore, thus says the Lord, if you return, I will restore you, and you shall stand before me. If you utter what is precious and not what is worthless, you shall be as my mouth. They shall turn to you, but you shall not turn to them. And I will make you to this people a fortified wall of bronze. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail over you, for I am with you to save you and deliver you, declares the Lord. I will deliver you out of the hand of the wicked and redeem you from the grasp of the ruthless. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 16th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, 
than on the things of man. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, you O Christ. Christ. Good morning, children. I'd like to invite you to join me uh, for a children's message this morning. We're going to go from the, the TV to our, our felt board today, so we're going to be moving around a little bit. I wanted to show you a picture of one of my last days in Japan. Um, you got that, Kim? One of my last days in Japan, hopefully you can see that, I was in the middle of a bamboo forest, right? I was walking down these streets and I could hear all the, the bamboo trees, they were so high and they were clacking in the wind. I could see the bamboo trees, but you know what I couldn't see? I couldn't see, I couldn't see the forest. Have you guys ever heard the expression, can't see the trees? for the forest? Well, that's what we're going to look at today. So um, if you can follow me over to the felt board, I want to help explain that concept of forest for the trees. And I'm going to let Kim get settled up. You got me, Kim? Because we're going to take a look at this comic strip right here. This comic strip right here, you see here, I'm going to read it for you. It says, keep looking at, it's two men in a boat. Keep looking at the crate. Is there anything else around? The other guy says, hmm, I think there may be a red flag somewhere. So I wonder, what should the guys in the boat be focusing on? The crate or the big, huge boat barreling toward them? They couldn't see the forest for the trees. They couldn't see the big picture, right? And so I want to take that idea, can't see the forest for the trees, can't see the big picture, and I want to talk to you about it from our, our gospel lesson today. I want to read this for you. It says, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and he began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man." And I tried to create that scene for you today. And as always, there's something that doesn't belong. So comment in the sections, and maybe Kim will let me know if there's anything there. So this is Jesus talking to his disciples about his plan, right? That he must suffer, die, and then rise. This is the empty tomb, right? This is what Jesus' purpose was. But Peter didn't see the big picture. He was thinking, no, Jesus, stay with us here. So Jesus told him to get behind him. Right? Jesus knew God's plan. Jesus could see the forest for the trees. Jesus knew God's big picture, that Jesus had to go and die for our sins. Jesus knew also that he would defeat death and you know why he did all that? He did all that for us. Because he, he didn't want us to stay here on earth. He wants us with him in heaven. Peter 
didn't see that. And I wonder, how often are we like Peter? We don't see God's plan. We don't see the forest for the trees. Or maybe sometimes we try to get in the way, like Peter did, of God's plan. Aren't we like that too? I know I am sometimes. And I know there's others out there. And that kind of makes us worried because we love Jesus and we want to be with Jesus. We want to go to heaven. But I got another series of verses that I want to read to you that I think will help. After Jesus had rose from the dead, he later met with his disciples. And in this one conversation with Peter, Jesus asked him, do you love me? And Jesus, or Peter replied, Lord, you know everything. Jesus knows God's big picture, right? Um, he says, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Now we are sinners just like Peter. But don't we still love God? Right? Jesus still says, feed my sheep. And that may be a, a confusing thing, especially in the agricultural world. It's not talking about literal sheep here. Who is he talking about? Who can you feed? Even though you're a sinner, but you still love God. You can feed your family, your friends, your classmates, your teammates. And what do you feed them? You feed them this message that Jesus has paid for their sins and loves them and wants them forever in heaven because he defeated sin, death, and the devil, and he did it for all people. And you, as his sheep as well, can feed other sheep, all those people that I mentioned. Right? We can also ask God to show us his plan for our lives. And so having said that, I'm going to close us in a prayer asking God to show us his plan. So would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we admit that we are sinners, but you love us and you died for us, and you still call us to participate with you in feeding your sheep. Help us to know who those sheep are and how we can feed and serve and talk with them about you, about your mercy, about your love, and about the joy that we have because one day we will get to live with you forever in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, did, any, did anyone respond? Some people responded. Okay, you want to tell me who? So the Mungia girls what? and then the Boston kids, they the, say the pyramids. The, the, the Mungia and the Boston say the pyramids. That's right. Thank you for paying attention. Here's your lollipop. It's virtual. Take it. All right, thank you for joining us today. Ocean going vessel, is that? Oh, the ocean going vessel? <laughs> well, maybe. That could be. Anyway, bye bye, guys. Letting go of every single dream. I lay each one down at your feet. Every moment of my wondering never changes what you see. I've tried to win this war, I confess. My hands are with me, I need your rest. Mighty warrior, king of the fight. No matter what I face, your body.
uh, good advice, right? Trust, 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 trust. Lord, uh, we trust in you. And we know that you are here to speak to us today through your word. We pray that the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts would be wholly acceptable and pleasing to you, that it would accomplish the purpose for which you send it to us today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, I don't know if you recognize this in our text this morning. The text is the gospel lesson, but the gospel lesson is um, actually a major turning point in the plot of the gospels. And I don't even know if you realize that the gospels have a plot, but they do. And the plot kind of goes like this, that Jesus, early in his ministry, he goes out and he is an actor on the, on the, on the great stage of history. He He's acting, he's, he's doing things, he's, he's teaching uh, really insightful Bible studies, he's preaching really interesting sermons that nobody falls asleep to, he's healing sick people, diseased people, he's feeding the hungry, he's calming storms, he's calming people's hearts, he's performing miracles, and people are really impressed and they are enthused and they are excited about following this man because this man um, gets stuff done. He is a great actor on the stage of history. But then uh, he comes to this region of Caesarea Philippi and he literally turns. He turns his face towards Jerusalem. He literally turns around, and this becomes this turning point in the plot of the Gospels. And Jesus says uh, in Caesarea Philippi, it is necessary, I must go to Jerusalem and be handed over, be handed over, be delivered to the chief priests and the Pharisees and suffer and die on the third day, rise again. I must be handed over. And his disciples are like, no, 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 no. Keep doing what you're doing. What you're doing is really working well, right? Teach and preach and heal and calm waters and walk on water and feed people. That is, that really works. And Jesus says, no, that is not why I came. It is necessary. I must be handed over and delivered unto death. And that is um, this great turning point. At, up to that point, he is an actor. After this point in the plot of the Gospels, he is not so much acting, he acts less, and he is acted upon more. So after this point in the Gospels, in the plot of the Gospels, he, he, uh, he teaches less. He preaches less. He performs fewer miracles. The focus of the Gospels after this point is not so much what he's doing, but rather what is being done to him. He is being opposed. He is being questioned. He is being challenged. He is being betrayed. He is being arrested. He is being interrogated. He is being handed over to Pilate. He is being delivered to crucifixion and death. That is the plot of the Gospels. Goes from active to passive. It goes from going out to coming back. It goes from uh, sort of this expanding world back to Jerusalem, to the very heart of the Gospel. And I will tell you, uh, that plot is very similar to the plot of life. I don't know if you've ever thought about your life having a plot, but it does. Every life has a similar plot, and it's very similar to the Gospels. So it starts when you are a baby, and you are um, completely dependent. You are a, a dependent soul, and your world is, is very tiny, just like... Um, little Don Noel Ortiz, who came to visit us at the office this past week. 
she didn't really literally come to the office to visit us because she's only, what, eight months old or so, Kim? Um, and so she can't do this by herself. She literally was handed over. She was delivered to us. And so I, I know this about Dawn Noel because it's true of every living soul. She's, she's starting out um, dependent, but sort of the plot of life is that she starts acting and she starts moving out and her world expands. And it's a beautiful, glorious thing when this happens. So I'm, I'm talking to you, Vincent, wherever you may be, and to Lacey. Uh, and, and at St. Paul's staff, between the three of us, we've raised a dozen uh, girls. So we know how this works, right? Uh, she will not be so dependent upon you forever. She will uh, reach, she will stretch herself, and she will grow in her independence. In fact, that will be a driving force in her life. And there will be ups and downs with that. In fact, she's probably already started some of this independent streak. You probably know this to be true. And some of it will be terrible, probably around when she's two. And then, and then she'll be sweet for a while, and then she'll enter fifth grade, and then you're ruined. But don't worry about that now. Uh, you have plenty to worry about at this time. And she'll keep, her world will keep getting bigger and bigger and larger and larger, and she'll become more independent and more independent. In 10th grade, you may not even see her. She'll just go right to her room and right onto uh, Twitter or whatever, whatever it is. And then maybe when she's a freshman uh, in college or so, maybe she'll move out. Maybe she'll go to UC Santa Cruz or UC Santa Barbara or Oklahoma State. I don't know where she'll go. Uh, but maybe she'll, she'll move out. She won't be ready. She'll still be uh, an idiot and a fool in, some, in many regards. But she'll go and she'll make mistakes. And, and maybe she'll go get an education and a degree, and maybe she'll get a degree in something that you know what you do with that degree, you, you move back. So there's some, back, there's some backtracking sometimes, and this, maybe she'll come home, but it won't be because she really wants to. But if she comes back in, into your house, it most likely will be because being independent, um, being on your own is expensive and hard. And so... She'll kind of come home, and it will be like assisted living, right? You will help her. And then maybe she'll move out again. This is the human nature, but at some point in every life, there is a turning point, and at some point, always, that this life, this plot of life goes from ever expanding, from being actors to being passive, there comes a point in every life where you get handed over. Now, we're kind of experiencing that right now in my family with my mother. My mother is um, getting up there in age. And my mother recently, um, by the way, my mother's watching, so I'm going to be real careful how I talk about this. Mom and sisters. But my mother recently moved back in with my sisters, which is a bit of a turn. The tables have turned there because it's usually my sisters who are moving in with my mother, right? Because they get along great, but it's not just getting along great because sometimes my sisters get to that point in their life where sometimes uh, being independent is expensive and difficult, and they move back home for assisted living. And they know uh, through history that if they move back uh, in with my mom, that she still does laundry, right? So that's a, like a big benefit, right? It's a assisted living, in a sense, uh, when you're young. But now the tables have turned, and my, my mom moved back in with my sisters, and it was a good move. It was a well-thought-out, discussed move. Because my mom and my sisters get along, but also because kind of we're moving toward that point where my mom was wise enough to realize I might need some help. I might need some assistance. And we just tend to fight that, that point in life. It's very difficult, and some of you know what I'm talking about, how difficult it is to, when you get to that point or with your parents or even in your own life where you might need a little help. 
again. Like when you were a little baby. In my in Chula Vista, there's this place. Uh, it's a wonderful place called Frederica Manor. I don't know if any of you have heard heard about it, but what it is is um, an assisted living home. But they don't call it Frederica Assisted Living Home. They call it Frederica Manor. And I have been involved at that place for years, and I've had people that I know that have gone to Frederica Manor, and it's always the same. It's, Mom, we're not putting you in a home. We're putting you in a manor, right? You understand why we have this language, because it's so hard. And no parent ever drives themselves to the manor. Nobody ever brings themselves, nobody ever says, I would like to go live in the manor. They're always driven there. In a sense, they're handed over. They're delivered. And if you've ever had to deliver someone to a manor, you know how hard that is. And I know some of you have had to do that. And nobody does that willingly. Nobody, does, nobody jumps up and down and says, I delivered my mother to the manor. I think I told you this story a while back, but I had a, I had a friend call me not a, a, few, a few months ago when his mother was dying in the hospital. And it, this was at the beginning of COVID. And how difficult that was that they were separated and he had to watch his mother deteriorate from the window of the parking lot of the hospital where she was staying because he wasn't allowed to be with her. And I'll never forget his phone call to me because we had talked and, and, and his prayer and our prayer was that she could, she could come home and she could die at home with her loved ones. And he, he called me and I can't, I'll never forget the phone call when he said, they handed her over today. And as much as that was his prayer request, how hard that phone call was for him to make and how deep the pain was for him that someone he loved and cared about was handed over. So can we really blame Peter can we really be that hard on him? Is it any wonder that Peter turns to Jesus and say, no, Lord, may it never be so for you? I think we're hard on Peter. We think he's a, an idiot and a fool, and he's just arguing with Jesus, and it's always a bad idea to argue with Jesus, right? Because you're going to lose that argument every time. But I would tell you, I think Peter there, we, we are like Peter in Jim is right. We are a lot like Peter. And one of the ways is that it is hard. It is hard when someone we love and care about is to that point of being handed over and delivered. We don't want that certainly for ourselves, let alone anyone else that we love and care about. But there's something different about Jesus. And the something different is that he's not an unwilling participant. He's not fighting this. He's not resisting this. He's not seeing this as a indignity. He's not, he's not somehow thinking that he's less of a person or he's lost his dignity. He's not worried about this. He's saying, this is why I came. This is the purpose. And Jim reminded you, and I will too, why, why, why did he willingly, why did he say, that's why I'm here, that's what I came to do, to be handed over, to be delivered unto death? Well, let me remind you. He did it, to, he did it for your sins, to die for your sins, to die on a cross for every sin that you ever committed, every mistake, every time you rebelled against God, every Every time you lost your temper, every time that you lied, you cheated, that you stole, that you neglected the law, 
that you showed up late for practice like these guys did today. Every time, Jesus died for that. That's why he came. He did it to show the full extent of his love. There's no more greater love than you'll ever see than Jesus extended upon the cross. He did that to show you how much he loves you. He did it for you. He willingly was handed over. He didn't fight it. He didn't resist it like so many do. He willingly allowed these things to be acted upon him when he had all the power to act. Why? All those reasons. But there's, there's one more that our text does highlight. He did it to show his glory. You see, the glory of Jesus, the glory of Jesus is not in what he did, but rather what was done. And so uh, he did all these things, and they're like he taught, and he preached, and he healed, and he did miracles, and those things are wonderful and beautiful and glorious, but Jesus makes clear, and this text makes clear, that his true glory is the cross. His true glory is that he was handed over. He allowed himself to be handed over and delivered. He was, he was passive. So that says something to us. Because this text also contains a call. Right? If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, pick up his cross, and follow me. But I will tell you, that call actually starts a few verses before that. The call to pick up your cross and follow is, is actually, I think, best uh, is, is first explained in Jesus' words to Peter. Right? Because this just isn't a slamming of Peter. This is an actual call to Peter and to all of us just like him who, who, who um, fight with this idea of surrender and not being active and not being in control and not being in command. Jesus says, get behind me. And yes, he says, get behind me, Satan. Because it's serious. Because if we don't get behind him, uh, we are uh, vulnerable to Satan. We can be a hindrance to the kingdom. If we think that the true glory of, the, of, of life, the whole point and plot of life is to get things done, then uh, anybody can, this is, this is Jesus' theory in my, my opinion, Anybody can teach, anybody can preach, anybody can do cool things. But the kingdom of God, the glory of God is seen in how we take on what the world sees as indignant. What the world fights, what the world um, tries to avoid. And so uh, the call to all of us, the call to you, the call to me, is to get behind Jesus, to deny ourselves and this idea to, that we have to control everything and the whole point of life is to get stuff done, to get behind Jesus and to pick up our cross. Why? Because the world needs this. Because there are people all throughout the world who have been handed over, who have been delivered to evil. And uh, Jesus goes to them and for them, and he identifies with our mortality in that way. And he calls us to follow him. So what about you? Maybe um, you're wondering what you're supposed to do in this kingdom of God. Certainly the scriptures say there will be some active things that some of you will do. The Bible says some of you will be 
pastors and teachers and evangelists. But all of you, all of you need to learn this turning point truth that the plot of life is to be passive, to turn and follow Jesus, to allow him to shape you and mold you. Anyone, Jesus says, which means everyone who, who would follow me must deny self, pick up the cross, and follow me. So maybe today, God is speaking to you who feel like in some area of your life you're being handed over, you're being delivered, and, you, and you're fighting it. You think maybe the solution is just more action, more doing. Jesus says, no, the place for you is behind me. Hand it over, because that's where Jesus is. And for that, we can be thankful. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, uh, we are grateful that your rebuke to us is, is really just a call to get behind you. A lot of us feel like we've been handed over, and there's lots of people in the world, Lord, everywhere who have been handed over and delivered. And you send us to them, and you send us to be with them and to care for them. And even those areas in our life where we feel handed over, Lord, are instruments in your hands as we follow you. As we follow you, Lord, may we reflect you and your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, now that we've heard the word of God both read and proclaimed, we can share our common faith together as believers. We'll use the words of the Apostles' Creed this morning. I invite you to join me as we confess these ancient words. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Too long on my own. I wasn't created to bear it alone. I hear your invitation to let it all go.
on for redemption the price for my heart I don't have a context for that kind of love I don't understand I can't comprehend all I know is I need you I run to the Father I fall into grace I'm done with the hiding No reason to wait My heart needs a surgeon My soul needs a friend So I run to the Father Again and again And again and again Oh, oh, oh Again Again and again and again and again and again. What good advice. Run to the Father. That is what prayer really is, my friends. We continue to pray as God's people for, the, for people everywhere according to their needs. So let me uh, share with you from the big book of prayer requests that which we have received from you. We encourage you to, to keep bringing us those uh, prayers so we can lift them up uh, on your behalf and for you and with you. We have some praise and thanksgiving for August Francis Lehman, uh, who was born to Carl and Elsie on August 25th. And uh, yes, brace yourself, Carl and Elsie. You have a daughter. Uh, good luck. Oh, son, I'm sorry. <laughs> you have a son. Uh, and, and prepare yourself. Arana Ferris is recovering from hip surgery. We thank you for her continued healing. Betty Hertz, has, uh, we thank, we are grateful for her continuing therapy as she recovers from a fracture in her, I can't read that, shoulder, hip, hip, thank you. We Pray for Paula Daniels as she will undergo knee surgery this Tuesday. 
We pray for a successful surgery and speedy recovery. We pray for Mercedes, a friend of Gina Spinoza, Randy Gray, as they recover from COVID-19. We pray for Tanya Milan as she recovers from thyroid surgery, for Cece Fergonez as she heals from leukemia, from George Fradel, who's battling liver cancer, Mercedes Benuelas and Tony as Mercedes' cancer has returned. For those who are impacted by COVID, for our first responders, for doctors and nurses, for wisdom, for those in leadership, and for those businesses who are starting up again. Also prayers for protection for our nation, for its leaders, for law enforcement officers, for their protection throughout the land, for peace in our nation, for victims of Hurricane Laura and California wildfire victims, and for the Great Commission. I'm sure there are other prayer requests, praise reports, things that are in your hearts and minds this morning. Let's bring those to the Lord as well. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for you hear our prayers and you answer according to your goodness. We know that you are in command and control and you have a plan and a purpose for all things and you watch over us. Nothing is outside of your vision, your care, your concern, your power, your grace, or mercy. We do have many things for which to bring you. Lord, and you've heard the requests of the people of God. We pray that you would answer each one according to your grace and mercy for healing, for comfort, for provision, for protection, for wisdom, for successful surgeries and quick recoveries, for the joy of, of, of new babies and the privilege of parenting, for the waters of baptism, and for turning points, that the truest turning point is when we turn to follow you. We lift up to you, to you also those things that are quiet on our hearts this morning that we name before you now. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. All of these things, Lord, we commit to you, trusting in your mercy through Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now receive the benediction, the blessing, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.
faithful and true. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. Let my heart burn when you speak a word, it will come to Good morning again, uh, St. Paul's. Hopefully uh, you were blessed and fed and nourished by worship and praise and, and reading of God's Word today. Uh, I have one announcement. Um, last week we dropped our first puppet video on our YouTube page, which is St. Paul's Hopeville. That's all one word if you want to find it really quickly. Um, so that's, we're going to be dropping another one on Wednesday. And so we invite all the children uh, to log on and take a look at that um, with the great help of our beautiful singers today, Jake and Layla and, and Christian. We, we put together some puppet videos, so we're going to be dropping them for the next four, um, four Wednesdays. You can log on to see that. And now, uh, I know she doesn't want to be on camera, but she's going to sit, have an announcement over the microphone. Laura has an announcement. Good morning, everyone. Just a reminder that today is our virtual coffee time because we do miss seeing you. So at 1030, I'll probably be on at 1015 if you need some help. Um, but you do need to download the Zoom application onto your smartphone, tablet, or computer. And if you'd like the access code, please text me or um, I'll be happy to email it to you as well. And that information is on our feed. So thank you. Have a blessed day. Thank you, Laura. I'm, I'm Jim and I are maintaining our social distancing. Uh, I just want you to know that uh, we continue to develop our online skills at St. Paul's, which we are not all that gifted at as staff. So we are getting ready to transition from Facebook to YouTube. Uh, the quality of our, of our streams should be um, improved, and 
This should be a little easier to access uh, for people all over virtual land, but we are looking for people who are interested and capable to help us. It is a bit high tech. We do are, are gonna need a little support for that. So if that is something you may be interested in, there may be a place for you here serving with us at St. Paul. So talk to Jim or myself or Kim, Kim, Jim or Mike, uh, and, and we'll, talk, we'll tell you more about it. Hope you're having a great uh, summer. It's almost over, it's almost fall. So hang in there, and, and as the COVID numbers come down, we're, we're, we can't wait to, to open our doors to you. So God bless you. You guys have a great week. We'll see you here soon. One, two, three, four. Great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness to me. From the rising sun to the setting sun, I will praise you. Great is your faith.